begin. The recording has begun. So Bill, do you want to go ahead and give your presentation? Sure. So it's my pleasure to introduce David. He rocked my world a few years ago. I grew up in a home with a warrior dad, World War II with George Patton. And prior to that, the Spanish Civil War. So those were two, quote, good wars, just wars. And uh, David's book, Wars a Lie, just um, rocked that foundation and got me thinking in new and different ways. And I will be always indebted for that. So you can, he's an author, activist, journalist, radio host. Where I see his name all the time is worldbeyondwar.org. And that's an amazingly active organization doing all kinds of things. Uh, his books include Wars a, Lie, Wars a Lie. He blogs at davidswanson.org and Wars is a crime.org. He hosts a talk show. He's a Nobel Peace Prize nominee and U.S. Peace Prize recipient. You can find his long bio at the uh, website for World Beyond War. And uh, you can follow him on Twitter. It's all there and Facebook and sign up for activist alert articles, David Swanson News, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but on a very personal level, besides shaking my foundation, I've got a, a project in Burundi, East Africa on sustainable peace building. And this is one of the poorest countries on the planet coming out of civil war and colonization. And uh, we had a number of young people who wanted to take advanced courses and David made it possible. So they have no money. Uh, we put a little bit towards it and he said, absolutely. And it's been a thrill for these young people to suddenly escape the boundaries of a tiny country in the middle of Africa and participate in a worldwide conversation. Uh, he's also been offering courses with authors of peace books. I'm taking three in the upcoming three months and if you're, uh, my, I think they're all full, but keep in, keep in mind, he's offering those kind of opportunities. That's exciting. And the last comment in, in keeping with the debacle at, in Afghanistan, uh, I keep going back to, and he challenges me to go back to Paul Kennedy's book, The Rise and Fall of Great Powers, that every empire in the last 500 years, according to Kennedy, has imploded because of military overstretch. And I think that's a lot of um, David Swanson's thesis that uh, we need to look at it because we're sacrificing our economy, our well-being, et cetera. So with that, David, rock their boats for us, please. <laughs> thank you, Bill, and thank you, Kevin, and thank you to all of you. Um, that I'm, and I'm very sorry I can't be physically in your beautiful part of the world, uh, those of you who are in Colorado, um, maybe someday. Uh, a, a wonderful introduction and, and wonderful that someone uh, is grateful for having their point of view challenged and changed. I think we all have to try to be grateful for that because it actually good thing. Um, I, I would note, however, that Bill's giving me personally credit for things that World Beyond War as a whole organization of lots of staff people and, and volunteers uh, have been doing. It's a, it's a big and growing organization. Um, so I'm going gonna, I, I, I'm gonna to show a, a PowerPoint uh, and go through a presentation and then do questions and answers and that maybe questions along the way. Uh, that this will be very interesting to see what I need to clarify. But I wanted to say two things really fast before even starting what I prepared some days ago, uh, just because of what is in the news. Uh, uh, the first one is that, and, and these will both come up uh, in the course of this presentation. Uh, the first one is that according to studies that have been done, and I will publish these remarks with all the footnotes uh, late tonight, 95% of terrorist suicide attacks in the world are aimed at getting a foreign military to stop occupying the terrorist's country, which impacts not one iota, the horrendous, murderous, evil, vicious, illegal, immoral nature of a terrorist attack, a suicide terrorist attack. Uh, but if you really wanted to eliminate suicide terrorist attacks from the world, you could be done with 95% of them in an instant just by ending military occupation. 
occupations of other people's countries. So there are virtually no suicide terrorist attacks ever happening uh, aimed at governments that aren't occupying somebody else's country with tanks and guns. Uh, the second point is that here we are looking at deaths and injuries and trauma and, and threats and danger, and every single bit of it is tragic and horrific, but it hardly dents the 20 years of mass slaughter. We don't have to wait till next week to talk about death and dying. This is principally what war is. It's death and dying on a massive scale, uh, likely in the millions in the past 20 years of Afghans in Afghanistan. Uh, and it's, it's you know great when the media in the United States is finally interested in deaths uh, and occasionally are compelled to be interested even in non-US deaths. The, the New York Times changed their headline overnight last night from uh, you know, 13 people who matter, US troops died in Afghanistan plus some Afghans to something along the lines of dozens of Afghans killed plus 13. So as if the Afghans may be somewhat mattered um but we're talking about 20 years of large scale uh killing and dying uh just to to have that context so i'm going to try and share my screen tell me if it's working and you're seeing a a powerpoint here um yes i want to thank you <laughs> i want to begin with five success stories i think we need success stories number one the peace movement the people who spent 20 years largely excluded from the corporate media, lobbying Congress members, well-paid not to listen to them, marching and protesting and holding teach-ins, making art, traveling across the globe, or staying put on the same street corner for decades to build alliances and awareness, writing books and teaching courses, interrupting events, divesting from profiteers, wearing t-shirts, persuading uncles, exposing lies, defending whistleblowers, mocking warmongers, celebrating peacemakers, and darn well screaming the most obvious truths until we could hardly stay on our feet, had an impact. Public opinion moved to our side and stayed there. Politicians pretended more and more to be on our side until they practically were, at least for one particular war that they call a mishandled, flawed effort, and we call, more succinctly, a war. I am not praising myself. There have always been millions who said don't do it and then said end it. And we have not been some sort of geniuses. We've just disapproved of mass murder no matter how you dressed it up. Number two, the Afghan army. These guys were armed to the teeth by US taxpayers and told to kill and die to slow the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. They were encouraged to launch a new civil war. These poor people who have never known peace, they were revved up and pepped up and informed of the need to honor Uncle Sam, Freedom, and Lockheed Martin, and they chose instead to refuse to fight. Afghanistan had a transition of power roughly as peaceful and orderly as that of the United States this past January. What horrors are to come from the Taliban rule we have yet to see? Which warlords will launch new wars remains to be revealed. Which people resort to the more effective strategies of nonviolent action we are seeing in the news. But there's not something worse than war, that more war could have been justified in preventing. Most people in polls in Europe say they would never fight in a war. That we should be angry that Afghans won't fight Afghans at the direction from NATO seems odd to me. Given their horrible choices, too many Afghans had come to view the Taliban as the lesser of two evils. U.S. voters are huge fans of lessers of two evils. We know all about those. But war is always the greater of two evils, and we should applaud President Joe Biden for withdrawing any troops he withdraws from anywhere, but not join with him in blaming Afghans for ending their so-called civil war the instant the foreign occupier cleared out. Number three, and yeah, this is a success story, although maybe not one we like, the weapons dealers. The war on Afghanistan was a major success in transferring wealth from ordinary people to war profiteers. Big military weapons stocks outperformed the stock market by 58%. 
the biggest weapons dealers get five times now each year from the US government what they got prior to this war. And there is no glimmer of a hint of a consideration that ending the war might change that. It's been normalized. In their legislation, including the big new progressive reconciliation bill, congressional so-called leaders lay out a plan for steady increases in military spending for each of the next 10 years, just because they can. And with no notion that the next nine years of it might accomplish anything that could possibly alter the supposed need for even more military spending in year number 10. Number four, the authoritarians. During the course of this war and the wars it spawned, governments, national and local, have been militarized. The world has been heavily armed. Government secrecy and surveillance have been accepted. Civil liberties have been eroded. And the word democracy has come to mean oligarchic but reliable weapons customers that put up a little pretense of caring. Number five, safety, democracy, and enlightenment. Just kidding. The war on terrorism has reduced terrorism, spread democracy, and enlightened those poor benighted foreigners who had been living in darkness. Okay, so I haven't verified any of that, but I did hear it on my television. So you can take it for what it's worth. And in any case, four out of five success stories is not bad. In fact, if you check out the latest from Peace Science Digest, if you go to peacesciencedigest.org, the more a country has contributed to the US war on terrorism, that is the, the greater number of troops they put in as tiny junior partners in the war on Afghanistan over the years, the more terrorism has come to that country. So the war on terrorism generates terrorism and proportionately to the extent you're involved in it. So let's talk about what we've learned about Afghanistan. What's happening? There we go. From our televisions. This is a picture of an old friend of the US government and military. Afghanistan is in truth far from the longest US war. There was no peace before or after it. There is no after it until they end it. And bombing has always been most of what it is. And we now have such threats of revenge from President Biden that he's probably going to be called finally presidential by television networks any moment. The war in Afghanistan has had nothing to do with opposing terrorism. It has been a one-sided slaughter, a mass killing over two decades by a single invading army and air force dragging along token mascots from dozens of vassal states. After 20 years, Afghanistan was one of the worst places to be on earth, and the earth as a whole was a worst place to be. The rule of law, the state of nature, the refugee crises, the spread of terrorism, the militarization of governments all worsened, and then the Taliban took over. When the U.S. armed the Afghan military with weapons costing enough to cause panic attacks in U.S. senators had the expense been for anything other than murder, and predicted a happy little civil war, and then the Afghans refused to fight each other. The President of the United States denounced such reprehensible restraint, blaming the victims, instead of acknowledging the massive gift of yet more weaponry to the Taliban. Instead of recognizing after 20 years, anything about what Afghanistan is like. Of course, he still calls the war a civil war as U.S. voices have done for years and years, because unless the U.S. military is regretfully helping out in a civil war waged by primitive people, it will be understood to be, you know, waging wars, smack in the middle of what U.S. academics call the great peace. The puppet government was never a government outside of the capital. The people were never loyal to the Taliban or the invaders, but merely to whichever set of lunatics was nearby waving guns. First, the Taliban collapsed, then the Muppets in Kabul, and for 20 years in between, every home and village switched sides as needed, with the US developing permanent enemies, with the Taliban making practical alliances and people persistently noticing that they lived where they lived 
while the strange looking foreigners who killed, imprisoned, tortured, mutilated, urinated upon, and threatened them for human rights lived somewhere else. But millions of people were made homeless, children froze to death in refugee camps, approximately half the victims of the US war were women. The puppet government passed a law to legalize spousal rape, yet the hypocritical screech of women's rights was heard over the agonized moaning of the injured, even as the US government blissfully armed and supported the brutal militaries of such bastions of women's rights as Algeria, Angola, Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Brunei, Burundi, Cambodia, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, China, Democratic Republic of Congo, Republic of Congo, Djibouti, Egypt, Equatorial Guinea, Eritrea, Eswatini, Ethiopia, Gabon, Iraq, Kazakhstan, Libya, Mauritania, Nicaragua, Oman, Qatar, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Syria, Tajikistan, Thailand, Turkey, Turkmenistan, Uganda, United Arab Emirates, Uzbekistan, Vietnam, and Yemen. The death, injury, trauma, homelessness, environmental destruction, governmental corruption, renewed drug dealing, and general catastrophe were kept quiet by an obsessive focus on the tiny percentage of deaths that were US troops, but excluding the majority even of those deaths because they were suicides. Collecting reports on war deaths in Afghanistan from direct violence gave Brown University's Cost of War Project a total of about 240,000. Nicholas Davies has pointed out that in Iraq in 2006, you had to multiply the reported deaths by 12 to get the number arrived at by scientific surveys co conducted in Iraq. And in Guatemala in 1996, you had to multiply by 20. Starting with 240,000 and multiplying by 12 gives 2.8 million, possibly dead directly from war violence in Afghanistan. Multiply by 20 and you get instead 4.8 million. Interest in this question is limited in the extreme. There have been no serious studies conducted in Afghanistan. The US corporate media reports on the topics are as non-existent as humanitarian wars. And according to President Biden, quote, American troops cannot and should not be fighting in a war and dying in a war that Afghan forces are not willing to fight for themselves, end quote. In fairness, Biden was upset at that moment by the failure of a new civil war to materialize. Nonetheless, someone could have told him that Afghan military deaths were at least 10 times those of the US military or the entire so-called intelligence, so-called community could have been replaced by a single historian or peace activist and the likely fate of foreign occupations might have been grasped 20 years sooner. There is no military solution. The generals and weapons funded presidents and Congress members have chanted for decades while pushing more militarism. Yet nobody has asked what solution even meant. We're winning, they lied for decades until everyone announced they'd lost. Yet nobody has asked what winning would have been. What was the goal? What was the purpose? The rhetoric, official and amateur, that launched the war was about bombing a nation full of people as revenge for the crimes of a small number of individuals who had spent some time in the place. Hey, Mr. Taliban song lyrics were racist, hateful, and genocidal celebrations of bombing the homes of people who dressed in pajamas. But this was pure murderous bullshit. Crimes can and should be prosecuted, not used as excuses to commit worse crimes. The Taliban was willing to turn bin Laden over to a third country to be put on trial, but the US government wanted a war. It had long since planned the war, its motivations included base construction, weapons placement, pipeline routing, and the launching of a war on Iraq as a continuation of an easier to start war on Afghanistan, a war that Tony Blair insisted on starting prior to any war on Iraq. Soon the US president said that bin Laden didn't matter at all. Then another US president said that bin Laden was dead. That didn't matter either as anyone paying the slightest attention had known it wouldn't. In fact, that same president escalated the war on Afghanistan threefold in terms of troop presence, but more than that in bombing, 
principally because he was largely keeping his predecessor's deal to scale back the war on Iraq. One can't just end a war without backing a different one. That's part of why the world's worried about a war on China right now. But then what was the excuse for the unending war on Afghanistan? Well, one excuse was a new bin Laden. He would return in another form like Voldemort if ever the US left Afghanistan. So after 20 years of a global war on terrorism spreading anti-US terrorism from a few Afghan caves to capitals across Africa and Asia, we're now told that the Taliban takeover may mean the return of terrorism. We're told this by the very same widely respected experts who had just said that the Taliban wouldn't take over. You know who never believed this stuff? The young men and women sent into Afghanistan from the United States year after year after year to become suicide risks and to, well, and to, to do what? What passes for winning in the propaganda given the troops and everyone else is just the horrific wars with disastrous short and long-term results that somebody had the sense to end more quickly than other wars. The Gulf War, the war on Libya. But they're not, of course, better than never having started them would have been. On August 16th, 2021, a US military base at Niagara Falls, New York posted this notice. I know you probably can't uh, read it, it's too small, but I can tell you that the import of it. While President Joe Biden swears that the nonsense about nation building was always nonsense, others cling to it. They were told they were doing it. They saw their buddies die in the name of doing it. On August 17th, an email from Lauren Mick, senior manager for media relations at the Office of the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction claimed, quote, there is no doubt, however, that the lives of millions of Afghans had been improved by US government interventions, including gains in life expectancy, the mortality of children under five, GDP per capita and literacy rates among others. End quote. Even if you believe that, imagine what doctors and teachers could have done in that regard. Hell, imagine what giving every man, woman, and child in Afghanistan some $600,000 or even a tiny fraction of that might have done, rather than blowing over a trillion dollars on war per year for 20 years. Afghanistan under the benevolent occupation was the third worst place to give birth in terms of newborn mortality with the first being the neighboring and heavily impacted Pakistan. The majority of marriages in Afghanistan during the humanitarian occupation were forced. This letter in this image illustrates one of the points I elaborated on in the book War is a Lie, namely that one can have contradictory war lies working simultaneously and certainly at different stages, especially before, during, and after a war. Let me count the lies uh, in this notice that was put up uh, at a US military base in, US, in the United States to rationalize the war for people who had taken part in it. Number one, progress, they claim, with no explanation given, so it's irrefutable but meaningless. Number two, the war making allowed people to vote, to attend school, to start a business, to live with basic necessities, by definition, anyone not killed in the war lives with basic necessities, just as prior to a war, only less so. The rest of this has been very weak for 20 years, and in fact, for 50 years, going back to the initial US provocation of the Soviets, back when the bad guys were the good guys, as they very well may soon be again. Number three, evidence-free prevention of imaginary attacks on the fatherland. Here they claim in this statement to have prevented attacks on the homeland. Those have been made more likely, not less likely by this war. Number four, saving fellow service members, but not sending them would have saved more of them. In fact, every single one of them. <laughs> Number five, planting small seeds of freedom's cause. I'm quoting here, I can't explain it. 
But what can I say about it except that people will reach for utter nonsense to justify horrible things that they've done? Now, you might say, surely this harmless foolishness is better than veteran suicides, better to comfort those who've taken part in a war by claiming there was some point in it than watching them commit suicide, but not if it succeeds at its stated purpose of facilitating future war making. Guess what one of the minor results of those future wars will be? More veteran suicides. Anybody familiar with the term snafu? At one point during the past 20 years, I sent some unsolicited advice to a young man who was considering offering the world the quote service of participating in wars. And this was part of what I sent him. Um, and this is, you know, chock full of footnotes and hyperlinks, but I don't know how to do those on Zoom. Are you aware that the US government repeatedly turned down offers to hand bin Laden over to a third nation to be put on trial, preferring instead a war? Have you come into contact with the understanding that, quote, if the CIA had not spent over a billion dollars arming Islamist militants in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union during the height of the Cold War, empowering jihadist godfathers like Ayman al-Zawahiri and Osama bin Laden in the process, the 9-11 attacks would have almost certainly not taken place, end quote. Are you familiar with the U.S. plans for war on Afghanistan that predated September 11, 2001? Have you seen the predictable excuses that bin Laden gave for his murderous crimes? They each involve revenge for other crimes committed by the U.S. military. Are you aware that war is a crime? under, among other laws, the United Nations Charter. Are you aware that Al-Qaeda planned September 11th in numerous nations and US states that, unlike Afghanistan, the United States chose not to bomb? I continued, are you familiar with the gross failures of the CIA and FBI leading up to 9-11? And this slide, by the way, gives a handful of quotes, there are dozens of them, of participants in the war on Afghanistan who typically immediately upon retirement said they were doing more harm than good, it was a bad idea, et cetera, before you know, in some cases going on to make the big bucks from the weapons dealers and the media outlets. Um, are you aware of the evidence of the role played by Saudi Arabia, close US ally, oil dealer, weapons customer, and partner in the war on Yemen? Did you know that British Prime Minister Tony Blair agreed to the future war on Iraq as long as Afghanistan was attacked first? Are you aware that the Taliban had practically eradicated opium prior to the war, but that the war made opium one of the Taliban's top two sources of funding? The other being, according to an investigation by the U.S. Congress, the U.S. military. Are you aware that the war on Afghanistan has killed huge numbers of people, devastated the natural environment, and left the society very vulnerable to coronavirus? Are you aware that the International Criminal Court is, now we have to say was, investigating the overwhelming evidence of horrendous atrocities by all sides during the war on Afghanistan? Have you noticed the habit of just retired U.S. military officials admitting that much of what they've been doing is counterproductive? Here are just a few examples in case you've missed any of them. I won't read them all to you, but I've given you the, the basic idea. Um, and I tried to provide some more context. Did you know that terrorism increased from 2001 through 2014, principally as a predictable result of the war on terrorism. A big, a basic question that a good education should bring one to ask about any field is this one, is it working? I assume you've asked that regarding counter-terrorism. I assume also that you've looked into what distinctions, if any, truly separate a terrorist attack from a counter-terrorist attack? Are you aware that 95% of all suicide terrorist attacks are indefensible crimes conducted to encourage foreign occupiers to leave the terrorists' home country? I tried to provide some alternative ideas. 
Did you know that on March 11, 2004, Al Qaeda bombs killed 191 people in Madrid, Spain, just before an election in which one party was campaigning against Spain's participation in the US led war on Iraq? The people of Spain voted the socialists into power and they removed all Spanish troops from Iraq by May. There were no more bombs in Spain. This history stands in strong contrast to that of Britain, the United States, and other nations that have responded to blowback with more war, generally producing more blowback. Are you aware of the suffering and death that polio used to cause and still causes and how hard many have worked for years to come very close to eradicating it and what a dramatic setback those efforts were handed when the CIA pretended to be vaccinating people in Pakistan while actually trying to find bin Laden. Did you know that it isn't legal in Pakistan or anywhere else to kidnap or to murder? Have you ever paused and listened to whistleblowers about their regrets? People like Jeffrey Sterling have some eye-opening stories to tell. So does Sean Westmoreland, so does Lisa Ling, so do many others. Recently, we would put Daniel Hale on that list. Were you aware that much of what we think about drones is fictional. Are you familiar with the dominant role that the US plays in weapons dealing and war, that it's responsible for some 80% of international arms dealing, 90% of foreign military bases, 50% of military spending, or that the US military arms, trains, and funds the militaries of 96% of the most oppressive governments on earth by its own definitions. Did you know that 3% of US military spending could end starvation on earth? Do you really believe when you stop to consider it that the current priorities of the US government serve to counter terrorism rather than to fuel it? We have real crises facing us that are far more severe than terrorism, no matter where you think terrorism comes from. The threat of nuclear apocalypse is higher than ever. The threat of irreversible climate collapse is higher than ever and massively contributed to by militarism. The trillions of dollars being dumped into militarism are desperately needed for actual defense against these dangers including spin-off catastrophes like coronavirus. Now we've been through two decades of atrocity aberration stories in Afghanistan. Some troops were hunting children, but that wasn't the norm. Some troops were peeing on corpses, but politely and respectfully creating the corpses was the norm. Innocent people were imprisoned and tortured, but only by mistake. We've been treated to two decades of regrets that crimes should have been committed more properly. So-and-so shouldn't have, shouldn't have pretended to be winning. Such and such shouldn't have pretended to be withdrawing. This and that shouldn't have lied about murders of civilians. Big shot so-and-so shouldn't have shown his brilliant plans for dragging out this madness to his girlfriend. We've been treated to two decades of imagining that mass killing can be reformed, but it cannot be. Remember that this was the good war, the war that one had to praise in order to oppose the war on Iraq without becoming some radical advocate of abolishing mass slaughter. But if this was a good war, a war that even peace activists pretended had been UN sanctioned simply because the war on Iraq had not been, one would hate to see a bad war. The big lies are not the lies in the Afghan papers, but the lies evident on the day the war began. Here are some of them and links to their refutations. This is a, a screenshot of a section of the World Beyond War website at worldbeyondwar.org. And you click each of these myths for an explanation of why war is not inevitable, not justified, not necessary, not beneficial and you click each of these reasons for ending the entire institution of war uh, for why it's immoral and dangerous us, erodes our liberties, promotes bigotry, wastes $2 trillion a year, threatens env the environment, impoverishes us, and how e alternatives exist. 
looking at these looking at these myths war is inevitable war is justified war is necessary war is beneficial if you're really good at the war propaganda game you can do the inverted myths i think i've got a slide on this yes this is master level war lying here peace is impossible peace is unjustifiable peace serves no purpose peace is dangerous and gets people killed these are themes in U.S. corporate media these days. People get hurt when you end good, stable wars. They die at airports. When you shoot them or let them crowd onto runways and generally run the airport like it's a branch of the snafu war machine you sent in for the non-nation building. What can the peaceniks say for themselves in such a moment? Well, here's what one of them says. On September 11th, 2001, I said, well, that proves all the weapons and wars are useless or counterproductive. Prosecute crimes as crimes and start disarming. When the U.S. government launched an illegal, immoral, sure to be catastrophic war on Afghanistan, I said, as many others said, that's illegal and immoral and sure to be catastrophic. End it now. When they didn't end it, I said, According to the Revolutionary Association of Women of Afghanistan, there's going to be hell when they end this, and it's going to be a worse hell the longer it takes them to end it, so end it now. When they didn't end it, I went to Kabul and I met with all kinds of people and saw that they clearly had a lousy, corrupt, foreign-backed puppet government with the looming threat of the Taliban, and neither choice was any good. Support nonviolent civil society, I said. Provide actual aid. Try democracy at home to lead by example. And redundantly, since democracy at home would have done this, get the military the hell out. Uh, where's my little cursor? When they still didn't end it. And when a congressional investigation found the top two sources of income for the Taliban to be the revived drug trade and the US military, I said, if you wait additional years or decades to get out, there's going to be no hope left. Get out now. By the way, the opioid epidemic in the United States seems to have been connected to the war that revived the world's largest opium production about as much as the next drought or hurricane will be connected to climate destruction. When Amnesty International put ads on bus stops in Chicago thanking NATO for the lovely war for women's rights, I pointed out that bombs blow up women just the same as men and marched to protest NATO. I asked people in Afghanistan and they said the same thing. When President Obama pretended to get out, I said, really get out, you lying, scheming fraud. When Trump got elected promising to get out and then didn't, I said, really get out, you lying, scheming fraud. When Hillary Clinton failed to get elected and evidence suggested that she'd have won had she credibly promised to end the wars, I said, do us all a favor and retire for God's sake. Presidents I proposed be impeached for this war among other grounds included Bush, Obama, Trump, and Biden. So now I've gone and offended both political parties, of course, and must apologize for burning my party membership cards rather than children. When they still didn't end the war, I said again, according to the Revolutionary Association of the Women of Afghanistan, there is going to be hell when they end this, and it's going to be worse the longer it takes. So end it now. When President Biden pretended to get out while promising to keep troops there and to increase the bombings. I said, really get out. I encouraged all the insiderish groups that said the same thing super gently and politely. I encouraged all the fed up groups blocking doors and streets and weapons trains. I supported efforts in every country involved to get their token troops out and stop legitimizing a US crime year after year after year. When Biden claimed the war was some sort of a success, 
I pointed out how it had spread anti-US terrorism across half the globe, spawned more wars, wars, murdered countless people, devastated the natural environment, eroded the rule of law and civil liberties and self-governance, and cost trillions of dollars. When the US government refused to abide by agreements, refused to stop bombing, refused to give credible negotiation or compromise a chance, refused to support the rule of law around the world or lead by example, refused to stop shipping weapons into the region, refused to even acknowledge that the Taliban is using US made weapons, but finally claimed it would get its troops out. I expected the US media outlets would develop a new, a strong interest in the rights of Afghan women, as they did. But the US government, according to its own reporting, accounts for 66% of all the weapons exported to the least democratic quintile of nations on earth. Of the 50 most oppressive governments identified by a US government funded study, the US arms 82% of them. Israel's government, notorious for its violent oppression of Palestinian people, is not on that list. It's a U.S.-funded list, but is the top recipient of, quote, aid funding for U.S. weapons from the U.S. government. There are some women who live in Palestine. The Stop Arming Human Rights Abusers Act, H.R. 4718, would prevent U.S. weapons sales to other nations that are in violation of international human rights law or international humanitarian law. During the last Congress, that bill, introduced by Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, gathered a grand total of zero co-sponsors. One of 41 U.S. armed oppressive nations on U.S. funded lists, Afghanistan was on the lists of oppressive nations before the Taliban threatened to take over. And the other 40 are of truly minimal interest to the US corporate media, much less to any of the but the women crowd out there moaning in agony that a war might end. The same crowd seems to have no objection to the proposal moving through the US Congress to force US women at age 18 to register for a military draft that would force them against their will to kill and die in more of these wars. So here's, here's a list, starting with point number one of things uh, we should do. What would I propose that the US government do for the women and men and children of Afghanistan now, regardless of horrible decisions in the past, that it is too late to undo and perhaps just silly and offensive for me to be rehashing like this. Well, number one, reform itself, the US government, into an entity capable of benevolent action. And until then, don't do a damn thing in Afghanistan. Get out and stay out. Lay off freezing Afghan funds or blocking international aid and end sanctions. Make Afghanistan neither a client state nor an enemy to be punished further. Stop encouraging the Taliban to think that it might someday become a model US client state by ceasing to arm and train and fund brutal dictatorships all over the globe. In 2019, the New York Times published this comment from the Taliban, quote, what they are saying to Americans is this, you have accepted Saudi Arabia and we won't do more than their basic code, retribution for murder, chop off the hand for robbing. Mr. Shinwari said, if you have accepted Saudi, what's wrong with us being another? The rest will be your priorities, aid, friendship, economic relations. Stop eroding the idea of the rule of law around the world by dropping opposition to the International Criminal Court and the World Court by joining the International Criminal Court and by eliminating the veto and democratizing the UN Security Council. Catch up with the world and cease being the leading holdout globally on, most, on the most major human rights treaties, including the Convention on the Rights of the Child, every single nation on earth has ratified except the United States and the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. Every single nation on earth has ratified except the US, Iran, Sudan, and Somalia. 
move 20% of the US military budget into useful things each year for five years. Shouldn't ending a war reduce rather than increase the US military budget? Move 10% of that rededicated funding into providing no strings attached actual aid and encouragement to the most law abiding and honest to God small d democratic poor nations on the planet. Take a hard look at the US government itself. Understand the powerful case that the US government could make for bombing itself were it not itself and take serious steps to remove the bribery from the election system, establish fair public funding and media coverage for elections, remove the gerrymandering, the filibuster, and as soon as possible, the United States Senate. Number eight, free and apologize to and thank every whistleblower who's told us what the US government was doing in Afghanistan for the past 20 years. Consider why we needed whistleblowers to tell us Number nine, prosecute or free and apologize to every prisoner at Guantanamo. Close the base and get out of Cuba. Now that innocent prisoners in Guantanamo can't quote return to a battlefield that's been abandoned, free them. Number 10, get out of the way of the International Criminal Court's prosecution of Taliban crimes in Afghanistan as well as crimes in Afghanistan committed by the Afghan government and the US government and the NATO governments. Number 11, swiftly become an entity that can credibly comment on horrors being committed by the Taliban through, among other things, caring enough about the horrors coming to all of humanity to invest heavily in ending the destruction of the Earth's climate and ending the existence of nuclear weapons. Number 12, let a million Afghans into the United States and fund the creation. By the way, this is a, a graphic here of a quote supposedly from Joe Biden 10 years ago when asked uh, about whether anyone should worry about Afghans put in danger if, when and if the war was ended. Um, you can read it for yourselves. Uh, let a million Afghans in now. Uh, and fund the creation of education centers at which they explain to people where Afghanistan is in the world and what the US military did to it for 20 years. I'm proposing this idea in the spirit of Nobel Peace Laureate Shirin Abadi's idea way back when, that instead of attacking Afghanistan, the US build schools across Afghanistan and name them for victims of the crimes of 9-11 thereby informing people who had mostly never heard about those crimes, much less been involved in committing them, instead of bombing them as revenge for those crimes, which is itself, of course, a greater crime. And with that, I will stop sharing uh, and assume that either you understood not a word or nothing needed clarification. Thank you very much, David. Just figured out how to unmute myself. <laughs> I'm going to stop the recording and then we will enter into our discussion period uh, where you can give feedback, ask questions, make statements, and so on and so forth. Um, so recording is stopping.